I, I think we need some different narratives out there to spark some conversations. Welcome to Tales with the Sales, where we discuss stories that matter because you are living one. I'm your host, Jane DeSales. I'm a writer, poet, and storyteller. It is my pleasure to introduce you to authors as we explore how fiction impacts our lives and culture. My guest today is Maya Sinha. She grew up in rural New Mexico before moving to California for law school. As a lawyer with school-aged kids, she wrote a humor column for the local newspaper. In 2019, she became a columnist for the Saturday Evening Post. Her debut novel, The City Mother, is available from Chrism Press. Visit her online at mayasinhawriter.com. Welcome to the show, Maya. We're so glad that you're with us today, and I'm really excited to hear what literature you've brought for us. Hi, Jane. It's great to be here. Today, I've brought one of my favorite all-time novels. It's called The Information. It's a 1995 novel by the British writer Martin Amos. And this book came out, as I say, in 1995. When I was in my 20s, I was living in a house in Berkeley, California, with some other girls about my age. I was working at a magazine in downtown San Francisco, trying to figure out if I wanted to be a journalist. And every day I would walk about 30 minutes from my house in North Berkeley to the Berkeley BART station, the subway station that goes under the bay to downtown San Francisco. And right on the corner was a bookstore. And so one day I had a little time and I popped in and this was one of the new releases. And this book changed my life in so many ways. I had never heard of Martin Amos, this very brilliant sort of edgy British writer. The content and the style and the subject, which is about the rivalry between two authors, an unsuccessful more artistic author and then sort of a hack writer who becomes very successful. It all resonated with me and it's helped me throughout my life trying to um, be a writer. Now, this particular passage I'm going to read is about the protagonist, Richard Tull, who narrates, I guess he doesn't narrate the story. He's the subject of the story. Um, Like I say, he's a struggling writer. He's about 40 years old. He's doing little reviews for not much money. He's very obscure. His wife is in marketing. The two of them have a distant relationship at this point. And he has twin sons, Marcus and Marius, who are four years old. And there's a lot of domestic life in this novel about a literary rivalry that was very interesting to me at at the time. So here we go. Take Richard. This was one of Gina's work days so it fell to him to do the boys. The following acts he performed self-consciously, conscientiously, or the other way around. Bath, snack, book, fresh water for their jug, Marco's medicines, more book, and the two dot-like fluoride pills pressed into their moist mouths, kiss. When the boys were done, Gina came down in her nightdress and cooked him a lamb chop and ate a bowl of rustic cereal and then went to bed. While they ate, Gina read a travel brochure in its entirety, and Richard read the first seven pages of Robert Southey, Gentleman Poet, his next book up for review. Later, heading for his study, where he intended to drink scotch and smoke dope for a couple of hours and examine his new destiny, he heard an italicized whisper through the half-open door of the box room that the boys shared and were rapidly outgrowing. Daddy! He looked in. Marius. What do you want now? Daddy? Daddy. What would you rather be, an Autobot or a Decepticon? Richard leaned his head against the door jamb. The twins were being particularly knowing and apposite that night. The twins with their subtle life, their weave of themes. Earlier in the bathroom, Marco had raised a characteristically crooked finger at a daddy long legs on the water pipe. Daddy, is that Spider-Man? Daddy with his long legs bent over the bath had answered, it looks more to me like Spider-Spider. Now Richard said to Marius, Autobot or Decepticon? A good question, like many of your questions. And guess what? I think I finally made up my mind. Which? No more Autobot. All Decepticon. Me too. Hush now. Mm. (laughs) Middle-aged dad, right? There's so much going on in there. And one of the first things that struck me as you were talking about when you encountered this book and the act of walking and walking into a bookstore and encountering this. And I know that so many people that are around our age take that for granted, but bookstores are becoming less and less. So the idea of just encountering a book by chance and then 
delving into the lives of these literary figures was unlikely in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a great luxury. I mean, like many things that we sort of took for granted back then to be able to walk into a physical place and browse and have lots of bookstores and even video stores, I would argue for movies, there's something about that experience of just wandering in, not knowing what you're looking for and discovering something that is, um, is really a rich experience. Well, and we do still get to have it at libraries, thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> and the few and bookstores that remain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we have a couple independent bookstores in Spokane still, and it's like holding on with their fingernails, you know. Yeah. But the other thing that struck me about this is just like you said, the domestic life. That's right, and it's it's funny because it's it's a, a novel that where the protagonist is, you know, he's obsessed with his status and his reputation and his successful friend, and there would be these little vignettes about these two twin boys and his wife and this very intimate life among the family. And I always wanted more of that. I mean, it's one of my favorite books of all time. And to this day, there are parts that I've just skipped because I just don't care that much about these secondary characters and their plots. But I always wanted more of this domestic scene narrated in this very granular, intimate way. And in some ways, that's the book I tried to write in many ways, because I was so I was so um, taken by this novel. In our modern culture, the domestic life does get a short shrift. People would think, well, what kind of plot can you have in a home life? But what it honestly reminds me of, and I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever seen the Japanimation movie, My Neighbor Totoro? I haven't. I highly recommend it. And it's something that might be accused of not having a ton of plot to it. <laughs> However, it is a masterpiece for all ages. And the reason being is um, Miyazaki is able to capture the life of a father and his two daughters so accurately in his animation that that's what I see coming from the piece that you're talking about is that these interactions in themselves are so human and so powerful that even without bombs bursting and gunfire and chase scenes, it calls to something just really visceral for us. That's right. It does seem so familiar and it's so easy to empathize with that character and see through the eyes of that character. Um, I will say that I, I worked hard to give my novel a plot and I, I want it, and it is possible to give it an, a, pl a plot, even though it's largely about domestic life, because this whole new genre has sprung up of sort of psychological suspense of, or domestic noir, which, which, you know, the locus of action is the home and the sort of anxieties and tensions and drama surrounding family life. And that's kind of a thing now. And so so it was fun to try and thread a page turning plot through the like like Martin Amos did through these scenes of very relatable day to day life with your children. Well, and I think you were successful in that. There's definitely the psychological suspense and things like that in your book that does center largely around the domestic life. So would you say that this book that you read by Amos, would you say that it was, was a big influence in you choosing to write on the domestic life? I think it was always in the back of my mind because, like I say, I read this book over and over and I read it in part because the style is so good. I mean, he has an incredible ear for language and um, just the rhythms of his prose and the, the risks he takes and the experimentation of, of writing this sort of jazzy prose style that's very contemporary. Um, I really liked that. And so just by virtue of, of even when I was in my 20s and didn't have kids and had no immediate plans to have kids in my early 20s, I really immersed myself in the book. And these were my favorite parts. And I knew even at the time that, yeah, as a woman, I'm really into him, like home with these twin four-year-olds. I want to hear more about these kids and, you know, and just what his life with them is like. That was the most interesting part of the book to me. Again, I always thought like, I wish there was like a woman, not that I'm the woman Martin Amos, I would never say that, but I wish there was a woman who could write in this way about having kids, you know? because he brings so much to bear intellectually. It's kind of a kitchen sink novel. And it also shows you what can be done with the novel. You can throw in everything. You can throw in there's humor, there's drama, there's suspense, there's the sort of philosophizing, the sort of, sort of cerebral passages with these sort of existentialist meditations on life, that it gets back to the kids, and he goes to fix the vacuum cleaner. I mean, you can put everything in. And sometimes I think that male novelists are, are a little bit bolder about just throwing everything in. It's like they, they won't shut up. They, they're just going to say whatever they want to say and throw it in their novel and out the door it goes. And that's kind of good in a way. It's kind of a good model to just say whatever you want and feel like, yeah, this goes in a novel. You know, why not? And then you have sort of a... Um, a lot to work with. I can see that. And I, I think that that's one thing that can be missing from many modern stories is that depth of experience. That yes, things need to drive the plot forward, but you need to care about the characters. They need to be real. 
all of these real bits actually add interest and that connection. And I find it interesting that it's able to form that connection and that uh, familiarity with family life, even when you don't have kids. That's right. And and in some ways, I think I sort of outgrew eventually Martin Amos's sort of take on life. He's sort of like a, a little bit of a sort of nihilist, atheist type of guy. And so I, the answers that he found, he was more about asking the questions than actually, I think, sort of sincerely and humbly looking for some answers, which my character tries to do. That's the difference. So after a while, okay, fine, you're, you know, you're throwing these questions out there, but you're, you're living this rather small life in a way. Um, so anyway, so that is something I moved beyond with, with other writers. This was a good intro to uh, a certain type of writing that, that definitely influenced the book. Well, and I like how you differentiate your philosophies and that he was asking a lot of good questions, but not truly looking for answers. Whereas your character, Kara, in The City Mother, is looking for answers. And that search takes her to some pretty challenging places. But isn't that a great metaphor for our own lives? Seeking truth takes us to challenging places. That's right. I, I, I would certainly say that. And, and even in the most mundane facts of life, I, I think the truth is always trying to speak to you. It's always trying to reveal itself to you. And so if you're perceptive and sensitive and you keep at it, it's almost unmissable after a while, you know, unless you're really locked in, um, if you're really locked into your position that, oh, nothing matters, it's all meaningless, we're, we're specks in the cosmos of nothingness, okay, fine, then maybe it's going to pass you by. But if you're a little softened up by experience, like like Kara is, and you, you're really trying to pay attention, she says somewhere in the book that the city was a text I read closely for two years, I was trying to figure out, you know, what to do. And if you if you read the world closely as a text and attend to it, a certain amount of truth is going to make its way to you. And and that's a truth that's ultimately very beautiful and consoling, I think. Well, and that it takes that power of observation, that it, it can be so subtle and in those little things, that it doesn't always come and whack you upside the head. That's right. Yeah. And I think subtlety is a great way of kind of describing City Mother, that it, that it is in all of this subtlety that she really starts asking deep questions about her identity and her place and what is reality. That's right. I think so. I think what she gets, what the character gets, she's um, she has these two uh, young children in quick succession. She's living in the city. She's left alone a lot of the time trying to figure out life. And it's been a major paradigm shift, as we say, to go from being sort of a single carefree uh, city girl to being a mother of two young kids without a lot of guidance or help or anybody to tell her you know, what is to be done now in the raising of these kids. And so what she, she, what she has is she's immersed in, on the one hand, the great love for her children, the great overpowering love for her children and urge to protect them and urge to be the best mother she can. And also at the same time, there's a certain amount of suffering um, in her life too. It's much more difficult than it was for various ways. And so between love and suffering, you're really in a sort of crucible of, you know, maybe, maybe you are going to be more perceptive. Maybe you are going to seek some answer that resolves these two twin poles of your existence. Um, and I think that's what she ultimately does. And I think this points to the fact that this is a Catholic book. And a lot of people automatically think that I would be referring to the religion of Catholicity, but I'm referring to the universality of Catholicity. And I see it as an examination of this universal experience of isolation that can happen in motherhood or in changing your state in life. And I think that even people who aren't mothers could identify that, and especially in light of the pandemic and the isolation that people have suffered within that. I, I think that's where City Mother really shines, is, is giving an honest look at how isolation can affect people. I think that's right. And I mean, it's even before the pandemic, but especially you know, especially now, there's been a lot of analysis about like this pandemic of loneliness, not just for mothers or for parents, but also just for a lot, I think just for young people, honestly, people in their 20s and 30s who have jumped through all the hoops and done what they're supposed to do. And they find themselves alone in an apartment with a pizza box and work the next day. And again, it's very disillusioning, you know, it can be a very lonely life. And especially with the, the sort of culture that we have around dating and marriage, where it's very hard to even find a, a lasting commitment at this point. And I think what what one of the things that is universal about the novel, not because I'm such a great literary genius, but because it's just an obvious fact of life, you know, motherhood, motherhood is it, it um, it's a bit 
the very state of being a mother of young kids is a bit countercultural today because what is our society about? Autonomy, independence, freedom, climbing the ladder, getting status, not being tied down, moving here, moving there, doing what you need to do. It is a very individualistic culture. And that's all well and good. When you're a mother of very young kids, individualism goes out the window for you. It is the one job that it is impossible to do alone. You've got to have help. You know, and so I've thought it through a little bit. Okay, well, you can have paid help, which is extremely expensive. You can have family help and you can have your husband help you. And ideally, maybe it's a mix of those things. But so many women, they're so, they, they, they're, they're so um, you know, their whole life has been in this uh, achievement oriented, atomized, you know, go, go, go culture where they're basically alone. And then they have kids and they do not have the resources around them to help them. And it, it is a bit of a crisis of isolation and loneliness and um, that you don't see in a lot of other societies and that you didn't used to see in this society because, you know, your mom would be down the street, and your cousin and your aunt and your sister. And, you know, being alone in a city in an apartment with little kids was unheard of, you know, like who would want that? But that's the norm now in a lot of ways. And so I think people relate that something something is out of joint here. Well, I think it's a reflection of two things. It's a reflection of kind of the materialistic downfall of our culture and that that striving and everything says the almighty dollar is your goal yeah. um and th- the sacrifice that it makes for that is community yeah even with the the decrease of participating in a in a religious community you know that that like you said you've got your family you've got paid help you've got your husband but there there would even be a larger community helping you out but we have become more atomized more of a literally cellular insulated peoples that's right and i think that unfortunately having children has has gone from being like oh this is the great this is a great boon to the family and the community like it's sort of like everybody's happy everybody wants you know, to share in that experience too. You had the kid, it's your problem. Good luck to you. It's very, it's very difficult. And, and there's certainly ways to plan around it. I think if you, if you go into it really understanding, if you go into it with the right culture and the right community and the right husband and the right religion, you, you can work around um, that predicament. But so many young women have no idea that, the, that they're even going to be in that predicament. They're blindsided by it. And so in my book, uh, this young woman is blindsided by it. And she's, um, yeah, it's a confusing time that she has to sort of work out on herself, by herself. You know, what what is really important here? Yeah, literally, like, what is real? What is true? You know? Mm. Well, and if we live in this society that treats children as a inconvenience yeah. or a surprise rather than an expected and welcomed new member of society, I mean, then this is the treatment that you're getting. And so, you know, flipping it from the perspective of the mother and the support that she needs and her not receiving that will flip that to the fact that this child is also owed a community. Right. That they aren't getting. And where does that take us societally and culturally when we have generations of adults who've grown up without their communities or their fathers or their extended families. And where do we tell, where are we telling them that their value lies at that point? Right. And, and unfortunately, not to be too gloomy, <laughs> not to be too gloomy about it, but you do, you do see that you see kids who, you know, their mom is working, their dad is working, they're, they're, you know, they're in institutional care all day long. That's the very best their parents can do. And they, they have an iPhone, an iPad in their hand from age five and up that entertains them. And, you know, then those kids get older. I mean, my kids are teenagers and, and these kids are really not in great shape mentally, socially, you know, they, they could be a lot better off if, 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 if the um, world they had been raised in was more able to give them the attention and care and love that they need, as opposed to sort of farming them out um, as, as an inconvenience, you know, like 12 hours a day, you know what I mean? And, and parents are doing the best they can. I don't want to blame the parents or the mom or anybody else. It's a very competitive society. And especially in certain parts of the country, just to keep a roof over your head, both parents have to work themselves, you know, they, they have to work all the time. And what, what has happened that our values have gotten so lopsided that this is, this is just sort of the norm now, you know? And so I think, Fortunately, the younger generations, there's there's a pushback against this. They, they want to sort of rewind the tape to a more community-based, a more sane way of living and raising kids. They don't necessarily feel like, you know, working all day and coming home and 
yeah, they, they, I think the girls especially, hopefully, do not feel like, you know, doing it all, you know, is maybe the, the greatest uh, goal of life is to try and do everything and juggle everything. It's very, very hard. And it's very hard to give your kids the the attention they need when you're trying to do everything for, you know, eight, the 18 years that they're home with you. It's not easy. And it, I don't even think it's natural, honestly. So I hope I hope this book, you know, starts some conversations around that with, with people. Um about about the plans that the plans you have to set in place to try to do it right. Mm. In some ways, looking at your book in that way, it's almost counter to what a lot of young people are going to be encountering in social media and in literature that's written to their age group, where it's just, you either have this fear of missing out, which would be a huge driver for trying to do it all, yeah, whether that's economic or experientially. But the other problem that you have with it is the literature that's geared towards them just further points out their isolation, further points out that it's all on you. It's all in your identity. It's all in what you, it's all very self-oriented rather than community oriented. And you're turning that lens out and you're saying that that self-oriented lens can turn to be self-destructive if it doesn't recognize its needs and seek to to meet those communal needs. That's right. I think it's a tremendous amount of pressure, even more today than it was on like kids of my generation. That your your job in life is to jump through all the hoops, you know, get all the grades, go to the college, go to the job, and then go out there and fashion your own identity, your own autonomous individual identity out of nothing, out of nothing among strangers, and try and make a fulfilling life for yourself with you know, period with no help. I mean, who who even wants to do that? That is a terrifying process. And it's not even, again, this is not a natural human way of life to not have any connections or community or just like no one's going to help you go out there and make a life for yourself. You know, who, I mean, that, that is very difficult. And I think my generation, you know, it wasn't quite as pronounced, but you, we went into it with a certain naivete about what was actually being expected of you. But now I think kids are very aware of the expectations that are placed on them. And it's all about them. It's all about the self. It's all about these different aspects of the self and identities and this and that and the other. It's very solipsistic and it's very lonely. And again, it's it's anti-human nature. I don't know how else to say it. You know, that is not a path to happiness and fulfillment. It's a path to self-obsession, loneliness, dissatisfaction. And I'm no social scientist, but I mean, I've been around a while and um, th- there's just a better way. There has got to be a better way to to do it <laughs> than what we're doing. Mm. I'm just absorbing all of these ideas right now. And what immediately comes to my mind is fighting the battle of isolation and confusion about the nature of the self with art. And that's exactly what you're doing, is trying to give a counter narrative to what especially young women are encountering in social media? Well, I hope so. I don't know how many young, young women are going to read it, but um, I do think we need a lot more, I guess you'd say, countercultural art and countercultural fiction and, you know, movies and TV and everything else. I think um, I, I think we need some different narratives out there to spark some conversations about like, are we just, are we just sort of blindly following these paths like lemmings to the sea? Or are we really thinking carefully about what, what does it mean to have a good life? You know, what does that actually mean? What does that look like in 21st century America? You know, not, not to be too, again, grandiose about my own novel, but I do think it, it is touching a nerve a little bit because it is just a different story about being a woman in modern America and the, the challenges of that. And it's, it's the kind of story that doesn't get told that much because who's the hero of it? A stay-at-home mom, you know? A stay-at-home mom with two little kids that everybody tends to discount and disregard, or maybe she's, you know, maybe she's mentally ill, or maybe she just can't hack it in the workplace. I mean, she's constantly sort of condescended to, but but she is the one who really figures out, you know, she has the best grasp of, of reality of anybody in the book. And eventually through the plot, in the end, that's sort of vindicated and she's able to go forward. But, you know, when does when is like a stay at home mom of two little kids in diapers, the hero of anything, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to even remember. I mean, that's just really not what's out there these days. Well, and I have to say, when I read this book, it was hard for me. It was a challenging read. I in my review, I actually used the word gritty and not gritty uh, 
in a bloody way, but in an emotional way. It it was both, it was kind of like sandpaper, that it kind of rubs raw but polishes at the same time. <laughs> because I am a homemaker. Like the protagonist, I quote unquote have an education, but I definitely wanted to be at home with my kids. I still want to be home with my kids and we have a fantastic time. But I think you're right that largely as a society, we have ignored the isolation of many, many people, but particularly mothers, because we're an easy target. That in a modern culture where birth control and things like that, they're like, well, you chose this. Right. You picked this. So, this is you your know, you made choice. your choice. Exactly. And so therefore you were entitled to no support because children are not a value to the community and you have opted out of a paycheck where you could be a quote unquote contributing member to society. Seeing a protagonist that knew my struggles was really eye opening and in a lot of ways more challenging than reading a fantasy or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. where uh, your, your protagonist is facing a dragon that, that that it's something that the whole world would see as a challenge. There is a dragon attacking yeah. the village. This is a problem for everybody. <laughs> but isolation is so interior that the rest of the world doesn't immediately look and say, oh, isolation is is harming our society and harming our, our families. Yes. That, yeah. That, and that's why I had to give it a plot because it is, in a way, it is a very interior novel. But like in that passage I just read by Martin Amos, again, that's a very interior scene. It's just one guy at home with his two kids thinking through the day. But it, it can also be very um, engaging and very winsome if you, if you couple it with some kind of a plot. Well, and the plot, the plot is very driving. The plot is very driving because I don't want people to mistake and not think that your character isn't a hero. Because she is, and the amazing thing—I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not about spoilers, but I do want to tell people one of my favorite themes in stories is people being seen. What I see with Kara is that she is a hero for stopping and seeing others, where she felt like she had been largely um, ignored or unsafe and things like that, and that helped her to be able to sense need in others that her, her suffering was not without value. I think that's right. I, I think that's right. And I tried to make her uh, the, the heroic turn of what she's able to do based on the very same things that were perceived as weaknesses. You know, okay, she's, she's just had these two kids. And anyway, the same changes in her that, that um, in part made her life difficult also gave her uh, capacities that, that maybe other people around her didn't have. You know, being so attuned to other people seeing them attending to their needs it you your 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 alertness or perception arguably changes you know you're just much more sensitive and so yeah that was that was how i tried to handle it um one thing i wanted to say um about this whole this whole issue of staying staying at home with your kids and raising your kids you know the the publisher of this um novel is chrism press it's a small indie press um, by women novelists. And it is a perfect example, just as you are and lots of other people are, that, that putting your kids first does not mean that you never have another objective achievement ever again. You could do a ton. It is amazing with women with four or five kids are able to do, you know, when the kids get a little bit older, right, just in a different phase of life or just went through whatever arrangements they've made. So it's not like at some point you you have to hang up your sort of creative capable, you know, your, your sort of your, your skills that translate into the world of paid work, that those are just gone forever. No, they're not. And it, it is, is possible to integrate them with, you know, taking care of your kids in very creative and I would think very fulfilling ways. I mean, I guess in my own way, I've, I've tried to do that too. I spend a lot of time with my kids and yet I've been able to write columns in a novel and hold down a job and it's all, and I'm, I'm not superwoman by any means, but it is possible. I mean, it's possible to have it all in a way if you're able to set your life up in a way that is sane and workable and where to me you, the family is the center of life like period that's the big stone in the jar and then it's it's surprising how much else can be fit around that mm. and i think you bring up a very important point that to be a homemaker doesn't mean or to be a mother that's dedicated to her children does does not need to be a prison right. In fact, it shouldn't, because then what are you reflecting to your kids about their value, particularly as women, but as individuals in general? It reminds me of when um, Jennifer Fulweiler was talking about her creative processes. 
I see you nodding your head. I know the audience (laughs) can't see I know. Don't we all? And one of the things that I, I found so valuable in what she had to say was she said, if you say that women can have no creative pursuits while they're raising small children, then you eliminate the voice in culture, the voice and influence and artistic um, contribution of women in their childbearing years from society altogether and how we are all poorer for that. Yeah, that's right. And and when, I mean, since I've been sort of, um, since I've been, you know, carping about modern life, I will say one thing that has, it has helped women a lot in modern life is just the technology, like what we're doing now, you know, Zoom meetings, the internet, self-publishing. I mean, there's so many venues, so many ways to get your creative work out there, your thoughts out there without going through these big gatekeepers. You know, I didn't have to have my book published by Harper Collins. Like I, I didn't need that. And, you know, I don't have to, I have a writing group that are, you know, one of the ladies is based in Germany, a couple of others in, are in upstate New York and we get together every couple of weeks. And so there's so many opportunities for um, independent voices, women's voices, even women who are, you know, working out of their bedrooms, like a lot of us are, no shame in that. Yeah. <laughs> Right, like, like you can me, do a lot. You, you can do a lot, and so like, thank you to this. This technology really has an upside um, to um, counter that isolation and and give people a, an outlet for their you know thinking and creating you know while being like literally in the heart of your house, which is pretty amazing. I love the way that you frame that because I have to say since we don't do video, people don't know that, yes, my podcast and my writing all happens in a tiny, like two by three foot corner of my bedroom, my small bedroom in my small house. And that that is okay. And I've thought, you know, maybe I should make a sound studio in the basement, or maybe I should, you know, all these things that cost money that I don't have. Um, But at the same token, I do need to focus on particular parts of my work. But the connection that I can have with my children at the same time is so valuable. And, to, and that I get to simultaneously show them that, yes, my work and my creative processes are important to me. And sometimes I do need to set aside time for that. But I also set aside time and space and relationship and a place in my heart for you. That that's, like you said, that's the center. That's the big rock in the jar. And for people who aren't catching the analogy that you put a large rock in a jar and you think, oh, the jar is full, but then you can add smaller pebbles. Is the jar full? Oh yeah, it's full. No, it's not. Then you add sand and it fills in all those cracks. Is the jar full? Not yet. You can still add water. And I think that that water for um, for Christians, for Catholics, the sacraments, prayer, scripture, and just immersion that giving ourselves, you know, when we think our life is full of other obligations, making sure that we set aside that time for immersion as well. My husband and I have both been working at home for a while, and that's fine. We weren't really set up for that. So I usually work in the dining room. But sometimes, like today, I tell my daughter, who's 13, hey, I, I need to be in a closed room. So can I use your room when, when you're at school? And she's like, sure, you can. You know, and it's so nice. Like, it, it, she gets to see that, yeah, mom has these other things she's doing. And, you know, it's it's like everybody pitching in. Like, if, if she has something that she needs help with, I'm happy to help her. I'm at her service. If I need to borrow her room <laughs> you know, an hour, she's happy to do that. Hey, mom, I'll clear off my desk, you know, good luck today. And it's just a really nice atmosphere where everybody is supported, everybody gets to be themselves. Now, it's not perfect, of course, family life has its little bumps in the road. But um, I think it's such a wholesome atmosphere that everybody's valued and loved. And this is our home. And it's kind of like, yeah, let's all let's all help each other. Um, So in that way, it's it's nice. That's such a beautiful image. That's such a beautiful image, because it's that outward looking idea that if if we can just push pause and look out and see the needs of those other people in our household and realize that a lot of those needs can be met within each other with little sacrifices they don't need to be enormous sometimes they are because that's the nature of life on earth it's just so beautiful that you're egging each other on to success together that it's about the success of the whole family which encompasses the success of the individual within it. Right. And, and not again, my family, certainly it's not, it's not a sort of model or anything, but it is a family. And if you give people that, if you give children that start in life, you know, that your family is a welcoming, warm, loving place where you're supported, where you're accepted, you know, that it really is kind of a haven for, again, you know, with its little bumps and whatever, 
then then why why would you then want to go from that to being in an apartment by yourself with you know the TV and takeout like it it makes the family seem very attractive it shows it for the great you know the great joy that it is a lot of the time and even even raising kids in an atmosphere of a loving family makes them more likely to want to recreate it for themselves um, and so I, I certainly try to do that I try I mean you know everybody tries to do that but I think that's very valuable and Again, I'm not super mom or anything like that, but just by being present and authentic and caring day after day after day, you, you, there is something really magic that happens, you know, between a parent and children. And so it's it's been it's been the best thing, obviously, in my life. I'm very happy <laughs> that I have it. I like to tell people that being a mom is simultaneously the most challenging thing I've ever done and the most rewarding thing I've ever done, that it's the hardest job I've ever had, which a lot of people are surprised that I say that because I was in the army and they're like, well, that must have been really hard. No, no, <laughs> no. Be being a mother is far more challenging in the army, especially as enlisted. You just kind of follow orders and, and move along it, it, when you're the mom there is so much more responsibility on you. And especially if you're a Christian and recognizing that you are forming an eternal soul or, or giving it a, a place to form itself properly, giving it the tools so it can form into what God intended that person to be. And that that's your right. job. That's your job is to provide that space and that safety, but also the challenges, the growth in virtue. And it's all on you, mama. And not all on you. Obviously, it, if you have a partner, that it's also them as well, the father, you know, that's that it's on both of you. Being that women tend to be very relationally minded. And this is, you know, I, I heard an incredible homily a couple of weeks ago, and it was talking about how much relationship matters. And my husband always teases me because anytime we have a discussion about something, the end result is, well, it all comes down to the relationship. <laughs> he would always tease me about that. And then we we're at mass a couple of weeks ago and the homily was all about how the triune God is in, is in eternal relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of makes sense that everything would kind of come down to relationship. It, it, it left me. Well, you know, the lens you bring up, I mean, the, everything you just said, um, see, before I, before I became Catholic, when I was just a, you know, a secular person trying to make my way in the world, none of what you've said would even make sense. I mean, because it's a much broader view of parenthood and really life than, okay, your job is to get these kids through high school with good grades and some extracurriculars and make sure they're healthy and make sure the, the sort of Christian or Catholic concept of what your role is as a mother and what the importance of that role is very different than, you know, I've got to get these kids in the right high school, the right college, the right job, the right internship, and pretty soon they'll be living in a two-story house in a good school district, you know, yay for me. I mean, well, and and it and it's so stuck in the material yeah. because it 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 ends up swaying you either you know depending on where your socioeconomic class lies then it sways you one direction or another that you either want your kid to be in your socioeconomic class or greater and you know like with the extreme breaches of capitalism or you want your child to get involved in the class struggle the war between yeah. classes and go ultra marxist and disestablish the system and become greater than where they came from. I just, it just realized it, it's almost like a psychological homelessness that you either need to carve out a place for yourself and whether, whether you're swinging Marxist or capitalist, that you need to carve out a place for yourself, that there's never this idea that you inherently belong. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. The striver mentality you have to strive, strive, strive to achieve some level of status or significance, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. It's um, like I say, it, it, to me, I mean, I, I would be Catholic for no other reason except it, that life is just so much more interesting and beautiful. And there's just, <laughs> it's just better, you know? Like, I mean, I do, of course, believe it. I'm very happy to be Catholic. But I mean, it, so anyway, this novel is a novel about from her going from one, one mindset to a completely different mindset and this long process of change um, is spurred by her having children and having to really confront the modern world on its own terms and say, I'm either, I'm either in this or I'm, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take a culture, counter-cultural path for, for my children and me. This has all just been so fascinating to me. 
And I'm interested to know, do you have more coming out for us in the future? I know City Mother is brand new, <laughs> but do you plan to write more novels for oh, us? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, this has been so encouraging. Um, just the, just even so far, the reception has gotten and the interest and the fact that I had this great publishing team at Chrism. Um, and I, I've always had a lot of ideas. And in the past, I put them in columns of a thousand words, you know, column here, column there. But I do have other novel ideas. And yeah, I'm going to get cracking because this has been, it's been a ton of fun. I'm, I'm very fun motivated, honestly. <laughs> So, so on that level alone, this has been really great, and um, I, I can't wait to do it again. Did you ever think? At what point did you ever think that you would write a novel? Uh, when I was twelve, I wanted to write a novel my entire life. I, I wrote my first novel when I was in fifth grade on an electric typewriter. So, literally, when I was twelve, we had to make a poster about our life goals. And my in my picture of my life goals, I had a novel called The Secret because I didn't know what the title would be. It was a secret. I was twelve. But, but that has always been in the background of all the other things I've done. I've always wanted to write a novel. So at long last, I have. And it's, it's really great. It, it is really great. And I, like I said, one of my favorite themes is this idea of being seen. And I love protagonists that are everyday people. Because um, in a previous interview with another author, we were talking about that those are the important stories, even in scripture, that a lot of times it takes an everyday person and shows how extraordinary their life really is. And all of our lives are extraordinary in light of eternity. But now I'm switching gears <laughs> on us with a really bad transition. And you know what, listeners, sometimes you're just going to have to deal with bad transitions, but I think it's time for the rando round. Okay. So here's the question for you. We've got our percentile dice and our 100 over-caffeinated questions. So I have tie-dye okay. and pink with green mermaid sparkles. Okay. Which set would you like? The mermaid sparkles, please. Mermaid sparkles. <laughs> How can I pass that up? It's a true question. How can you pass up mermaid sparkles? All right. We've got 14. If you could have a lifetime supply of anything, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, well, I fully expect to have a lifetime supply of coffee. If I don't, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> so, assuming that that is already locked in, if I could have a lifetime supply of something, I mean, I guess I have to say books as a writer, I, I would love to have, I mean, there's just so much I haven't read. And, and uh, I would love to be able to get whatever book I wanted, whenever I wanted for free, that would be fantastic. Oh, then you're going to need a really, really big house. <laughs> because I I have no... I. I think we have seven bookshelves in our house, and it's a little house. Like our house, I think by tax purposes, is considered 751 oh, square wow. feet. And there's four wow. of us and seven bookshelves, and they're full. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think we would have to build a house out of books if we had a lifetime supply of books. <laughs> Uh, my house is also pretty small. I lived in a, an apartment that was 750 square feet for five years. It's quite cozy. My kids and I spent a lot of time together because we were literally always in the same room pretty much. But, um, right. So it has its upsides. And so now we're in a slightly bigger house. And yeah, the books are, I mean, they're stacked everywhere. They're in the garage. The shelves are full. I'm at this awkward point where I have to start like getting rid of, getting rid of books to add more books, but I don't really want to get rid of any. So I'm at this I'm at this sort of standoff, like how to even do it. But, but if all if all the if all the details were taken care of, then a lifetime supply of books would be pretty great. <laughs> so you need so you would need a lifetime supply of books plus home library yes, space. Exactly, a lifetime supply of home library space. But you wouldn't want like all the library space delivered to you at once, no. because then you would have empty space. Be like, oh, I have to fill that. So you would need like um, some sort of magical universe where you could have a ever growing library that's space. right i'd have to enlist my husband and get him to put up like four feet of shelving at a time you know so over time we had full shelves all over the house and i may still do that honestly thinking through it that's a pretty good idea so <laughs> <laughs> see these interviews can be life-changing <laughs> life-changing let's see what else we come up with here 15 what are the odds of that what's the last time you really laughed out loud this morning this morning, uh, I got up at um, 5.30 a.m. My daughter was up with me and I said, now, look, 
it's fine if you're up with me, but do not talk to me before I've had a cup of coffee because I just I'm just up to just sort of like relax and have a cup of coffee. So she's up before me. We're sitting on the couch together, and she has a blanket. And I came sat sat next to her, was cozying up to her in her blanket, and she was like, "I, I thought you didn't even want me to talk to you." And I said, "Well, you have a blanket, so that changes everything." So anyway, we had a. <laughs> My, my daughter has a really, really good sense of humor. I mean, she is hilarious. And so I laugh all the time with her. When she's around, we're always laughing about something. My son, too. Both of my kids are pretty funny. Oh, isn't that great? Some of the conversations I have with my kids are really profound. And I was even thinking about the the part of the literature that you were reading and that um, Autobot versus Decepticon mm-hmm. question. I was like, oh, that's deep. That's deep. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because the, the, it's it's these kind of questions that you sit and talk about with your kids. And of course, there are some conversations you can't have with kids that you have with adults. But kids can be great conversationalists if you treat them like they are. That's right. Yeah, they really can. They they're quite funny. And even in the book, she's she's motivated. To, she's sort of this bookish person that really doesn't think about having kids. But then she's seated next to two kids at a work lunch that just happened to tag along. And these kids are so delightful and bubbling with life. And they're so sort of interesting and funny that she's like, wow, you're like, why, why aren't I around more kids, you know? And so sometimes you really do, you really, even as a single person who's not around kids, um, they're, they're just quite delightful. And, you know, life is just not the same really without kids around in some capacity. So, yeah. Oh, and I, I grew up an only child and I didn't babysit till I was in my thirties. <laughs> so I was like the clueless, the, the clueless mom when I eventually had kids. And my husband was the youngest by far of three boys. And so the two of us were like, what do we do? <laughs> and you would think in a lot of ways that that would be so frightening and intimidating. But at the same token, there was a lot of freedom in it that we got to figure out how to make family work for our mm-hmm. family together and with the people that we were. And so maybe in some ways it was a blessing because we didn't have preconceived notions. Yeah. And you just lucked out, probably. <laughs> you didn't make any major oh. errors. <laughs> oh, well, and I'm sure we made plenty of major errors. And I think that that's where the humility yeah. comes in. And um, maybe that's why God made me a mom, because I need an enormous dose mm-hmm. of humility. And, and he delivers. He delivers. He does. Even, I mean, this last two few weeks, my book has come out. And, you know, these I, I'll get these nice little things about it on social media or whatever. And I'll tell my kids and I'll be like, hey, mom, you know, is that mac and cheese ready or what? You know, it just it keeps you. It keeps you <laughs> <laughs> they do not care on some level. So, okay, I'll get it. I'll get it. No problem. It's good. Well, but can you really blame no. them? Because, I mean, this is mac and cheese we're yeah. talking about here. <laughs> this is important. Let's put priorities right. where they belong, mom. All right. 21. What's your most joyful childhood memory? Mm, What is it? You know, um, I grew up in rural New Mexico in a little town and my grandmother's house was in Downey, California, which was a suburb of California. So we would go there probably every summer, at least every other summer. It felt like every summer. And she had a little kidney shaped pool in the backyard. And so we would spend weeks there in the summer at her pool outside in Los Angeles, going to the mall. I mean, it was fantastic for somebody just from the sticks to even be anywhere around like a mall and a pool in California. And when I think back on those days, and my, my grandmother was an impeccable housekeeper. I mean, it was like being in a four-star hotel the whole time we were there. Like the house was beautiful and we had like beautiful dinners every night and the pool. But what I what I remember being so gratifying was when I was 11 or 12, I got into the Anne of Green Gables series. And so I was reading them at my grandmother's house that summer. And I would sit on the couch with a Coca-Cola and a bowl of goldfish crackers and read this series just one after the other. And I was just in heaven. Like that was like the best time of my entire life to be just on the couch in my grandmother's, you know, surrounded by my family, my mom, my siblings, everything was good, you know, and, and I got to read my book and eat goldfish crackers and a Coke. And I've been trying to recapture that feeling ever since in some ways <laughs> and chasing that sensation like the rest of my life. Cause it was, it was just great. You notice I started a podcast about reading novels, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'm trying to recapture the being in a hammock in the side yard at my granny's house growing up eating up Nancy Drew's is what I did. So you notice how simple that is. Like you were surrounded by loving people and a good story. And that's all it took to make your most. And I mean, yes, you had the, the exciting things of city life, but that those simple things just made you happy. Yes. The last question I ask all of my guests is what gives you hope right now? Mm, what gives me hope? Um, well, let's see here. I mean, one of the things, um, 
one of the things we've been doing recently is um, we've been going to mass in different places. There's a, a beautiful Latin mass in Sacramento, not too far from where we live. And my husband and I just went to another uh, mass of this beautiful little church um, near the bay this weekend. And I think because I'm a convert and the, the beauty of the, the Catholic faith and the mass and, and all the stuff, right, that the statues and the candles and the incense and, you know, people dress up and at the Latin mass, they're wearing veils. Like to me, that is all brand new. And I have to say that in that atmosphere, I do feel a great deal of hope because because it's so ancient that you feel like, you know what, people have this. This is the secret of how to live in this world. You know, people have somehow figured it out that that they, they have figured out the the source of peace and happiness, you know, in the midst of everything. And I'm just at the beginning of sort of taking that in. Um, but it does it does give me a lot of hope that that you know this just keeps going on and on and on no matter what else is happening on the news or whatever you know it just doesn't matter in a way because you you have this connection with the eternal and with these ancient traditions that nothing can take away from you and that has given me hope for me and for my kids to even be able to expose them to that and just you know remember like this is always out here for you like any town you're in any place in the world pop in it's waiting you know. I'm like, okay, good, you know, good. Even after I'm gone, like this isn't going anywhere. And that that has given me hope during these past years, which is these past two years, which have been very difficult and disorienting uh, for everybody, the, the rapid, rapid pace of change. But you know what? The mass isn't changing. Well, I think that gives us just some beautiful imagery and a fantastic reminder of what to focus on when things get hard. Maya, I'm so glad that you came to join me for this conversation today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this conversation, click on the follow button for more tales every other Tuesday. And in the meantime, read stories that matter because you are living one.